yeah, what I like to do today in numerical methods is to continue on the Monte Carlo integration. And yeah, maybe this is an important session because I like to give you more intuition why the Monte Carlo method is having this special feature that its convergence rate in higher dimensions is independent of the dimension, but has this strange issue that the convergence result only holds in probability. And actually, when we implement it in the computer, we use the pointwise convergence result. So we just look at a single event. So maybe it's not even admissible to use this method, yeah, because we do not know if that specific sample converges. But we will see today that this probabilistic nature is uh, not a bug, it's a feature. And it is exactly the thing that enables this independence of the dimension. And then in a later session, it's even possible to get rid of this probabilistic thing and to have some pointwise convergence result. So we are in the section on the Monte Carlo method, more specifically on looking at Monte Carlo integration. So Monte Carlo integration, our definition of the Monte Carlo integral is here. So since we can approximate the expectation by this running sum and the expectation is an integral, we can think of this as an approximation of the integral by just taking um, a sequence of IID random variables, XI, so here uniform, and that approximates then the integral of f of x dx if we look at the sequence of f of x i, where x i is this sequence of vector valued i i d uniform random variables. And you see that here the function f, yeah, so the image space of the random variables, is in d dimensions. Yeah? So we were looking here at rd. The striking thing here in our convergence result, so in our error estimate, so you see here that we have a convergence rate that is one divided by square root of n, n being the number of sample points. The striking thing is that the D doesn't appear in this estimate. And yeah, in order to understand this, yeah, that this is actually something special, uh, we also look back at classical integration rule. So we had here a look at the Simpsons rule here in one dimension. So that just takes a very special structure of points, of sample points. So not random function evaluation points, very special function evaluation points with very special coefficients. And that specific scheme yeah, then led to uh, cancel cancellations in the Taylor expansion uh, of the function, such that you get a very high order of convergence. So here you have an order of convergence h to the power of four. And if h is the length here of such an interval, it is in one divided by m, m the number of points to the power of four. So let's compare now Monte Carlo integration with classical integration also looking later at this feature that we can make this comparison in higher dimension. So the most striking advantage of the Monte Carlo method is that the convergence rate is independent of the dimension. We need to generate um, a random vector in D dimensions, but 
we already saw that this just scales linear in the dimension. So we just populate every component of this vector one by the other from a one dimensional sequence. So we just need D samples yeah, to create one sample in D dimensions. There is another nice um, advantage of the Monte Carlo method, which I have maybe not yet mentioned. And it is that since this sequence that we have, the XI, is a random sequence, so there is no rule how these points are generated, I can just add more points to increase the accuracy. So say, for example, you already calculated a Monte Carlo integral with 1,000 points, then you can just add another batch of 1,000 points and average the two uh, to get a Monte Carlo integral with 2,000 points. So this is not maybe possible with a rule like the Simpsons rule, where the points have a special structure and the coefficients also have a special structure. So if you add more points, it may be that your set of evaluation points is completely different. So for example, just adding 100 points to a set of 1000 points, since the points are equi equidistant, will generate a lot of new points. Yeah? Um, because there's a shift, yeah? And um, yeah, also the coefficients, it's not so trivial to see how you can merge two such integrals. So the Monte Carlo method has the ability to improve the accuracy by just averaging multiple independent um, calculations. So maybe I give you a small sketch, yeah? on the next slide. Um, this is of course just coming from the fact that the method is so simple. Uh, it has so few structure. It's just random points and it doesn't care. Uh, it's an IID independent uh, uh, sequence. So it doesn't care what has happened before. Uh, the next point is just as the previous point, a new sample point. But um, the disadvantage is that everything holds only in probability. So maybe you can go to our coding sessions and try that out. Yeah? So try to improve the Monte Carlo integral by just having two independent integrals and just averaging them. And you will see, okay, you have convergence rate one divided by square root of the number of points. So if you take two integrals yeah, with 1000 points, yeah, now you have one integral with 2000 points, it improves the accuracy by a one divided by square root of two. Yeah? So twice as many points, one divided by square root of two, the error in probability. So if you'd like to have a small picture, yeah, this looks, as follows. So for the Monte Carlo, you take sample points on your interval, say zero and one. Okay, they are, they are random. This is a Monte Carlo integral now with four points. Then you could calculate another Monte Carlo integral with four points. Okay. Taking the average of the two is just as if you would calculate the Monte Carlo integral with the eight points that consist of the union of the sample points. So I just have these eight sample points. If you look at the Simpsons rule, So we have a very special discretization scheme. So our discretization scheme was here the end point, then the middle point. And maybe if we have another 
So if you have two Simpsons rules, it's like that. Yeah. So we have two Simpsons rules with the blue center points and the green one is the middle point or the end point of the two intervals. So these get a coefficient of four of four. This gets a coefficient of, of two. Yeah. So now if you would like to say, improve the accuracy. So maybe I would like to have one more integral part. So then I would have something like that. So they get the coefficient four for the blue ones and they get the coefficient two for the green ones. That was the scheme for the Simpsons rule. then it's actually not clear what you should do to improve the previous result to get the improved result. Yeah. So uh, actually in this special case, yeah, there are some points here that are shared among, but there are also some points yeah, that I can't suddenly replaced by other points. Yeah. So the previous function evaluation is not even used. So you see that this special structure is a disadvantage. And for the Monte Carlo, you could just add a few more points. And it even doesn't matter that we add the same number of points. We just need to do the right averaging. For example, if that guy here is missing, okay, he's just missing here. Yeah. Okay. So that's... Uh, a nice um, advantage of the Monte Carlo method that we can combine different simulations to create a big one. And that's of course also uh, nice from a programming perspective because it enables us to easily parallelize the calculations, for example, across different machines or different CPUs or on a GPU. So I have um, a code session on this uh, later, when we worked a little bit more on, on random numbers. Uh, yeah, that's a nice um, application. Okay, so, and now comes uh, the interesting thing uh, that I would like to give you an intuition why the Monte Carlo method achieves this independence in high dimension. So first recall, this is here our um, estimate. So we have here our Monte Carlo integral, just function evaluations on random points. So this is here my sequence of random numbers, which I can interpret as a drawing of my original random variable or as a single event on a sequence of IID random variables. And um, then I compare that with the true value of the integral. And we have that this error can be estimated by sigma divided by square root of delta times square root of n. Um, and the probability that we are um, below that bound is larger than one minus delta. So we have, if delta is small, we have a large probability that we are in this bound. However, if data is small, the bound is not very tight, yeah? but we can make it tighter by making the N larger. Uh, an important remark that will um, pop up later, you see that there's also here um, a dependency on the variability of the function F. And clearly if the function F is, uh, we are not varying much. For example, if it is a constant, then just one point would be enough, yeah? Because the integral here over a constant is just the value of the constant. And of course, just evaluating this constant and dividing here with n equals one is also that constant. So you see the error also depends on the variability of this function. And that's the first thing that we have to rem remember here. Um, all these error estimates for the Simpsons rule and for the Monte Carlo, 
they should hold for all possible functions. And in what I will do next, I will look at maybe special functions. So we choose maybe the function in a way that is problematic yeah, for the integration rule. And we can explore a little bit um, how the error depends on that. Also note that this thing that the error had some constant that is related to the variability of the function also occurred in the Simpsons rule. For the Simpsons rule, that was our error estimate. So this is the one dimensional one, but doesn't matter for that point. So here we have our integral. Here we have our Simpsons approximation scheme. And there is a dependency here on the fourth derivative of the function f. And again, for example, if the function is a constant, yeah, that guy would be zero and one point would be enough. Yeah? So also here, there is some constant that uh, depends on how much is the function vary. So all this stuff is quite analog. The unsatisfactory part of our Monte Carlo um, error estimate was that it only holds in probability. So it's mentioned here, yeah, the probability that we are below this is larger than something. Okay, but the delta is not zero, though there is still the possibility that a single event, and in the computer we are using a single event, falls outside that bound. So if you just make here one Monte Carlo drawing, yeah, then we have a non-zero probability that the error estimate does not hold. Okay, so you might say, okay, then maybe I just do in the computer just another calculation with another sequence and I just check multiple sequences. Um, actually, this does not fix the problem because from what we just saw is, two different Monte Carlo integrals with different sequences are maybe just like one guy with the union of the two sequences. So it's a larger sequence. So if you interpret this now in terms of our convergence rate, so using more Monte Carlo drawings, does not fix this probabilistic error estimate because either you can use now this to improve the probability. So you can make the delta parameter smaller you know, with a factor of one half by just doubling the end parameter. So that means Here you have the same bound with a smaller delta. So you can make the probability that you miss this bound, the same bad bound, uh, smaller by taking more points, but you cannot make it to zero. Or you can improve the accuracy by a factor of one divided by square root of two. So you keep here the same delta here, but you just make the bound smaller. So if you now double the number of points, you get here a one divided by square root of two smaller in the bound. But the whole result stays probabilistic. Yeah, I also gave you already the teaser that we can get rid of this, but for that you have to wait a little bit. And now let's investigate why this thing doesn't depend on uh, the dimension. So just uh, to recall the error estimate of the Simpsons rule 
was in one dimension with um, one divided by n, n is the number of points to the power of four. In higher dimensions, yeah, we needed a Cartesian product. So it was n to the power of minus four divided by d. For the Monte Carlo integral, the convergence rate was slower in one dimension, one divided by square root of n, so n to the power of minus one half, but there was no uh, parameter d inside. So if you compare the two, you see that, for example, in higher dimensions, so for d larger than eight, actually Monte Carlo is better. So n here denotes the number of uh, function evaluations. As I already mentioned, the two constants here in front, they depend on the function and they somehow have inside the information, how much does the function vary? How much does it change on the interval zero one or on the cube, d dimensional cube? So this convergence result is given in a probabilistic sense and it is the probability or the, it is the probabilistic nature that creates this independence. And to illustrate how this is achieved, uh, just consider um, the two dimensional case, yeah? because then I can draw nice pictures here um, on the slides. So I like to calculate um, the integral of a function of two variables. So f, defined on zero one squared. Yeah? So let's call it here f of x1, x2. And if you now take um, a classical integration rule, like for example, the Simpsons rule, um, you would just take the one dimensional rule and combine it to a two dimensional rule by iterating the integration rules. So what you will do is you will first fix the, say for example, x2 coordinate. So for every x2, now f is seen as a function of x1 only. And then you consider the one dimensional integral that just integrates over x1. So you perform the integration, for example, along these lines for fixed um, x2. So for example, we had our Simpsons integration rule here. So then once you have done that for many x2s, you just integrate these results. So you just integrate here the function g over x2. So the two dimensional integral is an iterative procedure of just one dimensional integrals. Maybe also easy to implement, you just implement the one dimensional rule and just call it yeah, on the functions where other coordinates are fixed. So for example, if you don't think now of the Simpsons rule, which is well, a bit special, yeah, complicated scheme. If you just think of a classical uh, Riemann sum. So that means now my one dimensional integration rule is much simpler. So for example, uh, I just have now the one dimensional integration rule. So now I would like to integrate here um, the function um, H of C. So let's call it C. Uh, so say I would like to integrate this between zero and one. Well, then I can just make here um, an equidistant discretization and I can just choose the center points. So we will choose the center points of these um, intervals here to integrate the function H. So, so maybe we have here some center point 
Okay, and that center point is here. And maybe that center point is here. And we just integrate now the function h, yeah, so maybe the h is running here like that. Okay, so you just take um, the center points and evaluate the function at the center points. So the center points, okay, that should be xc here, my center point xi. Okay, it's just i divided by m. So if I choose i divided by m, it is the left end point. So it's i plus one half divided by m to be the center, center point. Um, if you just take this uh, classical uh, Riemann sum and you do this iterative procedure that you define now uh, for every um, x2, the inter integral over x1, um, yeah, then this looks in two dimensions. that you take here the center points of these small uh, rectangles. Okay. And how many center points uh, do I have? Yeah, if I take M points in one dimension, it's M to the power of D points. Yeah, here it would be then m to the power of two points in total. And you see that we now run through a Cartesian product of points that is given by the discretization in the first dimension and the discretization in the second dimension. So I have here um, x1 and x2, and I perform the function evaluation on these points here, given in, in two dimensions. So you see the um, exponential growth in the dimension is coming actually from the Cartesian product. The error, yeah, the integration error of a one dimensional integration, of course, only depends on the number of points I use in that dimension. So here it is three. I have a one dimensional rule. I use three points in that dimension. Let's explore this situation a little bit. So consider the case where we use say four points in each dimension. So here is now the case D is equal to two, M is equal to four. So N is four times four, it's 16. So we have these 16 points. And now consider a special function. Yeah? So as I mentioned, I will now construct special functions. And the function is such that the integration rule performs badly. So what I like to do is I would like to consider the special case where the function does not depend on x2. So the function is just a function that depends on some x1, so on the x1 coordinate, but for x2, it's always the same. In that case, if we go back, it means that the inner integral is always the same, yeah? We are always calculating the same inner integral. So you see here, the function does not depend on x2. So actually G is constant, yeah? So all these guys here are just um, uh, the same. So that means the only thing I'm doing is that I'm calculating an integral in x1 direction. So that point here is the same as that point, is has the same value as that point, has the same value at that point. So if I look along these lines, 
it's all the same value. Okay. The same here, it's all the same value. And all I'm doing is I'm calculating a one dimensional integral with four points. So my integration rule has 16 points, but I'm actually wasting a lot of function valuations and I'm just using a one dimensional integration with four points. So of course the error is just um, of order one divided by M, M equal four, and then, okay, depending on the integration rule that you use to the power of something yeah, uh, for the Simpsons rule to the power of four, but um, we actually had to divide here with the dimension. Yeah, so we lost we lost all the functional evaluations that occurred in the other dimension. Okay, so now you're saying, okay, let's be clever, uh, and maybe we can improve the accuracy of this integral by not taking the same point in the x1 coordinate when we change the x2 coordinate. So I could just maybe here use some other point, for example, a point that is a little bit to the right, yeah, that is a little bit shifted. Then you know, that would correspond to an x1 coordinate that is different and it would have contributed a new function evaluation. Note that when we go back here to the example where I mentioned the Riemann sum, that this Riemann sum in the two dimensions looks exactly like a Monte Carlo integral. It's just a very special structure of the points, right? So it is. This, it looks the same. It's just giving me a very special structure of the points. So the difference in these integration rules is just the structure of the points. And I'd like to discuss now the structure of the points. So idea in the situation where the function does not depend on x2, it may be now an advantage to change the valuation points such that the x1 component is always different when you change the X2 component. So in that case, it's maybe possible to uh, sample the X1 component with many more points. Say for example, all the points, N is equal M times M, the 16 points. Um, a simple example that achieved this is to choose now the evaluation points, my sequence xi tilde as a little bit modified. So the x2i of the sequence, yeah? so the ith element of the x, uh, sequence and the um, x2 coordinate is just the previous one, the x2i. But then I perform small shifts here to the xi component. So whenever here the x2 component changes, I add a small change. So there is a modulus one here. Yeah? So it means if this adding some change is moving out of the interval, I, uh, I re-enter on the other side. Okay, if you look now at the figure, figure nine here, then you see what I'm doing. Yeah, these here were my original points. But now if the X2 is changing, I shift a little bit to the right yeah, to get different point in X1. So, and actually what you need to shift is um, a quarter of the um, interval. Huh? So that means instead of being in the center point, you then have all the points, left end point, right end point, and the two quarter points. So, and if that point here moves out, uh, it enters it enters here. Okay, anyway, how you would uh, program this, uh, it just means that now I have that all these function evaluations have a different 
x1 component. And remember, my function was a function that only depends on x1. Yeah? So the setup was that my f of x1, x2 is some h of x1. So now if I perform this um, integration here, so I have a one divided by n sum i from zero to n minus one. Yeah? So my Riemann sum is just like the uh, Monte Carlo integral. So with an f of x1, x2. So that means now I take this with the, the tilde guys. Yeah? So I take this here with the tilde guys. And I have here the average over h of, well, h of x1 tilde. But x1 tilde is just many different points. So that's now a nice one. So this guy is um, an x1. I plus a x two i, yeah. So many many different uh, values. So this is x one i. Okay, so we get many different function evaluations if we look at this projection here on the x one component, and you see now I'm calculating here a one dimensional integral. with 16 points. No? So my error estimate is much better. No? So I had in the previous example, m equal four, just four points. Now I have 16 points. So my error estimate is much better. So it is as if it would be independent of the dimension. No? So I'm using here only four points because I'm wasting the guys to the dimension. And now I'm using 16 point, points as if the dimension would be equal to one. Okay, so that's somehow I could achieve the independence of the dimension. Yeah, but now I started by thinking of an evil function f yeah. So here it was a function that did not depend on x2, an evil function f uh, that is maybe yeah, behaving badly under the integration rule. Of course, I can just now think of another function f that behaves a little bit differently and has the same defect. Okay, so what kind of function would you choose? Okay, you just would choose a function well, previously the function was constant along that line. So now you choose a function that is constant along that line. Okay, that would have the same, the same issue. So now I choose a function that is actually constant on these lines. So it only depends actually on this direction here, yeah, orthogonal to, to these lines. And if then the points are structured in that way, it means, okay, the function value is the same along that line. So it means that you calculate always the same value here. And your one dimensional integration is again, just as if you would use M equals four points. So you have again, another function that has the poor convergence because you wasted a lot of function evaluations to the higher dimensions. So that's why the convergence rate in the classical integration rule that performs these Cartesian product things um, has this dependency on the dimension because there is the structure in, in uh, moved to, to the dimension and you can find a special function having this structure that 
only sees then the projection of the points. So we have here this issue yeah, that our little trick with the shift only leads to a better convergence if the function does not depend on x2. So now if you have a function f that depends only on the coordinate that is represented by this line, so x1 plus a x2i, yeah, so actually a is this little slope, yeah, if you view x1 as a function of x2, then you would have the same problem. So again, we achieve only the accuracy of a one-dimensional integration rule with um, sample points. Okay, now comes the funny thing. Let's have a look back to the Monte Carlo method and see what the Monte Carlo method does. For the Monte Carlo method, we choose a random sample point. So if we add another point, say for example, XK, okay, then this guy is now a two-dimensional vector, so it's xk1 and xk2. Then this guy is random, so iid, so independent from the previous one, so completely independent from the structure, but not only the point is independent, it's also the components. Yeah? So we have here iid components. So there's also no link between the dimensions. Yeah? In other words, since the method is random, the probability that you hit any such line is zero. Okay, so in any dimension, if you make such a line, the probability to hit this line is zero. So you see that the randomness or this unstructured thing is actually the feature that avoids the, this problem. So we add a new point in every dimension. So for this uh, structured method, it's that you add new points in the say X2 coordinate, having the same x1 coordinate. So you only add to one dimension and then you change the x1 coordinate, but you keep the same x2 coordinate. So only, you only add to one dimension. So here you add something new to every dimension because all these guys are new random numbers. They do not even depend on the previous component. So you have also independence in the dimensions. Okay, and that's, the thing that creates this uh, special uh, yeah, special property. And now you can also think why our construction, we construct a special function yeah, uh, that uh, has this issue. This does not work. Okay, because the function is there at first and then we take uh, random samples. So the randomness, so this using unstructured points, this is not a bug here. Yeah? It's actually um, a feature that enables this, this property. So going through my script here, the last remark here, yeah, in contrast, the Monte Carlo integration chooses evaluation points randomly and important. It does this in every component. Yeah? So the probability that a coordinate occurs twice is zero. So for the structured one, some coordinates occurred multiple times. So already maybe a hint to the next chapter when we now look at how we generate random numbers. You see that the feature is that the sequence is unstructured. So also in the um, different coordinates. And this is then the way that we will get later 
rid of this probabilistic nature because it's no longer that we would like to construct a sequence that is random. We would like to create um, a sequence that is as unstructured as possible in all coordinates in all dimensions. This is then the section on low disk Kwanzaa sequences. So summary, Monte Carlo um, integration has yeah, some nice um, advantages. It's very simple. Uh, also nice, we can increase the accuracy by just adding more evaluations. Okay, that's nice from a programmer perspective. And also very famous, the convergence rate is independent of the dimension. That was it for the Monte Carlo method. And now comes the next building block. How do we generate such a random number sequence?